Good morning, Sandals. Uh, my name's Andrew Bogenwright. I am actually the campus pastor up at our Woodcrest location. So I'm excited to be down the hill with you guys this morning. Thanks. So I don't know about you, fellas, but um, I was one of the guys at Albertsons this morning at 6 a.m. You know, it was like all dudes, the only time I've ever seen all dudes in a grocery store, you know, getting flowers. And conveniently, they also have a Starbucks there. So I'm like, I can get her a nice little coffee. This is a great deal. And there's something about those Starbucks that are in grocery stores where they don't have everything, right? So it's like the one thing you need or like, oh, we can't use the phone. You can only use a regular card, whatever. There's always something that you can't do there. So thankfully, we live in America and within a mile, there's always a regular Starbucks in distance of the grocery store Starbucks. So I took care of it made a, a little special moment for my wife this morning. I'm excited. Hey, it's Mother's Day. It's a great day. I'm excited to be here with you guys. Uh, I have a, an incredible mom. She's been amazing through the years. And um, you're going to get to see a picture of her in her awesome 80s glasses and just rocking it. You know, that's me when I was my son's age. And uh, she's just been an incredible inspiration and um, just an example of a godly woman. And I'm also married to an amazing woman who is now a mother. This is her second Mother's Day, and we were excited to to celebrate that together with uh, our family. And um, man, it's been uh, quite a journey, a lot of hopeful Mother's Days where we were hoping to be parents, and so we're finally getting to uh, celebrate that together. Now, I know many of you are coming from different places. Some of you guys are excited. It's Mother's Day. You get to be celebrated. Some of you are hopeful like we were for many years. Some of you are grieving. Uh, some of you just can't wait to get your kids out of the house so you're not an active, as active mother anymore. I, I don't know where you're at, but this morning's message is not a, a silly mom is the bomb kind of message. It's actually for everybody this morning. I believe that God has something that he wants to say to each and every person here, and so I'm excited to share with you. We are going to be talking about the most famous mom in all of human history. Everybody knows who she is. There's no mistaking who who it is. It's Mary, the mother of Jesus. She is the most famous mom ever to walk this earth. And I just want to kind of let you in on her story. I mean, she was a, a young teenage girl living in Israel, engaged to be married, you know, had, had dreams and hopes for her life. And all of a sudden, it's all disrupted by this angel entering into her life and saying, hey, guess what? You're going to have a baby. And she asks an appropriate question, how can that be? I'm a virgin. And the angel goes on to explain, hey, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, and this baby's going to be special. He's going to be the chosen one of God, the son of God. And so she's like wrestling with this, and all of a sudden has this amazing response of, okay, I'm God's servant. Let's do this. And she goes and visits her relative, Elizabeth. And as soon as she walks in the door, Elizabeth's baby, uh, John the Baptist, jumps for joy in her womb. And she goes, you are blessed and so is a child in your womb. And Mary responds with this 10-verse rant about God's amazing power and how incredible he is. So that kind of sets the stage for the story today. It's 35 verses in Luke 1 if you want to read them. Didn't want to put that on your outline this morning. So there it is in summary format. But I was just thinking about what a powerful moment for Mary. And what a scary moment. She has all these hopes and dreams for her life. She has these expectations of marrying this guy who's going to provide for her and how many kids they're going to have and where they're going to live in the suburbs of of Nazareth and, you know, what, what things are going to be like. And all of a sudden is completely disrupted. Her life is completely changed by this visitor, this angel. And I started thinking about why Mary, out of all the people in all the places in the world, why was she the one chosen to give birth to Jesus? She didn't have 25 kids already. It wasn't because of her track record. She's already proven she's a great mom. Let's make you know, her the mom of Jesus because she's already the best. It wasn't because she had done all these spectacular things. She was a teenager, right? We know some teenagers. Like, we know what they're like. I mean, why, why, why Mary out of all the people? Why, why was she chosen to be this special person? She was young, she was poor, and she was insignificant. 
She didn't have wealth. She didn't have notoriety. She didn't have position in society. She was probably roughly 13 years old. She had nothing special about her. She was an ordinary girl. Ordinary girl. And I was thinking about how fitting it is for us to consider ourselves in light of that. I think if you're like me, most of us feel pretty ordinary. Right? There's nothing, nothing special about us. You know, people aren't lining up to get our autograph. Right? Uh, maybe they are for you, but not for me. You know, they're not like, you know, waiting at the door to see, man, you're awesome. You're incredible. You're special. You're unique. We're ordinary. Like all throughout my life, I remember growing up just feeling very average. I wasn't, I didn't suck, you know. No one said like, you're the worst, right? I, I was just an average kid, you know. Pretty decent at sports, decent at school, decent at things, but not incredible. And then as I got older and started losing my hair, I had to shave my head. And then I became even more ordinary. You know, and people come up to me all the time. They're like, hey, I know someone who looks like you. I'm like, no, it's just because I look generic. That's it. <laughs> There's just nothing special about me. But I have got Kelly Slater before, so I'll take that. You know, I'll take that one to the bank. Look it up if you don't know who he is. But, um, you know, we feel very ordinary. We feel like there's no reason why God would do something special in my life. Why God would give me anything or use me to do anything. We feel incredibly ordinary. But we desire to be extraordinary. I think within each of us is that desire to do something that matters, something that lasts, something that the next generation talks about. Something that, that means something in our life. You know, even those who say, no, I'm fine being on the sidelines, man. You get them talking. They got, they got plans for the world, right? You know, they, they've got ideas of how things should be. They've got things they've learned that they want to share. Everybody's got it in them. We want to be extraordinary. And yet we're stuck in these ordinary bodies in this ordinary life, living kind of the day-to-day mundane of life. And this is Mary, ordinary Mary, living out her life. And all of a sudden, everything changed. Because no one would argue that Mary was extraordinary, right? Everybody would say, if there's one extraordinary woman in history, it's Mary, the mother of Jesus. I mean, she stood out above all else. But she was so ordinary. Why, why her? So I, w- I want to point out a few things. I think um, she gives us a, an example of what it can mean to live an extraordinary life. So in order to live an extraordinary life, I must guard my heart. I must guard my heart. Man, our hearts are deceitful, aren't they? They lead us down all kinds of crazy paths. Man, if we listen to our heart, we'll be all over the map. I mean, if you've ever um, prepared for something important like speaking to a thousand people, um, your heart does some crazy stuff, man. I mean, I I was PMSing all week. I was all over the map. My poor wife is having to take care of me, you know. Um, Even on Mother's Day weekend, I'm I'm all over the place because my heart is deceitful. It, It takes me all kinds of places, and when we follow it, we get into trouble. I mean, just imagine... A modern teenage girl getting the news that Mary did. OMG. An angel just totes appeared to me. And I'm going to have like a totes adorbs baby. But oh well, YOLO, you know. (laughs) Right? I mean, that's, that's the culture that we live in. So she had done something to guard her heart, right? She wasn't like every other girl. There's something special about her. And when we see a little bit later in Luke chapter 2... When the wise men came to visit Jesus, and it says about her, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. Mary had an incredible inner life. Something was going on inside of her that was different than everybody else. She was attentive to God as a 13-year-old girl, attentive, paying attention to the work of the Holy Spirit in her life. What what an incredible thing. Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Man, if we can go back in time and just tattoo that on our forearm so we could see it, right? Guard your heart. Man, we would have made a lot of different decisions. We would have t- our life wouldn't have taken all the twists and turns that it did, but, but it did. And so we can see in the example of Mary to guard our heart. And we're, we're starting this Activate series, and our kids right now are learning about the chest plate of righteousness, the thing that covers the heart, right? I mean, you can lose an arm, and they'll figure out how to, you know, put you back together. But, like, if you lose your heart, you're done, Right? The heart is so important. It is the core to who we are, and it's the key. And so in order to live an extraordinary life, I must guard my heart, and I also must live by the extraordinary power of the Holy Spirit. Extraordinary power of the Holy Spirit. So what does that mean? I want to talk about the Holy Spirit a little bit, because maybe you have some ideas about what he is or what he isn't. You know, maybe you've seen people like handle snakes in the power of the Holy Spirit, 
or like wave flags and do somersaults at the same time, bark like dogs. I mean, these are real things, people. There's churches doing that right now. They're doing that. And they're claiming it's the power of the Holy Spirit. So who's the Holy Spirit? He is God himself. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He exists in three persons, and the Holy Spirit is a person. And the Bible says this, that when you receive Jesus Christ, when you ask him to forgive uh, forgive you of your sins, to, to come into your life, to be born again, you receive the Holy Spirit, and the person of God comes to dwell in you. That's powerful, right? I mean, that's worth, worth the price of admission this morning. I mean, if you go away with that, knowing that the God of the universe, if you're in Christ, lives inside of you, that's something to think about. I mean, just think about the extraordinary power of God himself coming to dwell in us. It's this incredible mystery. And he is real. And Mary, when he, in responding, or when she's talking with the angel, the angel says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And that overshadow you part just got me all week as I was looking at this. Overshadows the naturalness. Overshadows the ordinariness. Overshadows the blandness of who we are as people. And when the Holy Spirit engages, man, it's something special. It's something new. It's something worth looking at and engaging in. Insignificant lives become extraordinary by the power of the Holy Spirit and nothing else, right? Nothing else. And, and so we, we wrestle with this because we long to be extraordinary. Man, as I was preparing for this this week, I, I was just wrestling. I've never spent so much time on a message because I felt like it just wouldn't come together. I wanted to be extraordinary, right? I wanted you guys to like me. <laughs> I wanted to not suck. I wanted, you know, Pastor Matt to not fire me, you know, whatever, whatever. I wanted to be extraordinary, and I felt like God was just pressing in on me, and I had a a friend affirm it, that you need to be yourself, your ordinary self, and it's the power of God that's extraordinary. It's not you. And if you're going to hear anything today, it's going to be the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart through words that I'm giving today. We, We just long to be extraordinary, but the reality is that the Holy Spirit works in the mundane of the day to day. The day to day of following Him bowing ourselves before him, uh, just being in his presence. And the Holy Spirit does things that we can't do on our own. Paul, the author of half the New Testament, the most powerful um, speaker, evangelist the world's ever known, wrote this in 1 Corinthians. He said, My message and my preaching were very plain. Rather than using clever and persuasive speeches, I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. Man, that verse was a relief to me all week, (laughs) let me tell you. Right, so then I can just, if I suck, man, it was the Holy Spirit, he just didn't, you, you weren't listening to him, sorry, my bad, I mean, you're bad. Um, but, but that's the reality, right? He ignites something inside of us that has nothing to do with what's going on on the outside, but what he wants to do. And so how does the Holy Spirit work through us? He, d- he does so when we're willing to humbly serve, when we're willing to humbly serve. Now this is pretty cou- counterintuitive to how we live our lives, Right? My wife's awesome, and she does the laundry, and she folds it and everything, and all she asks of me is to carry my portion to my bedroom. And I'm like, I don't want to, you know, uh, kicking my feet the whole time, complaining. Right? We're not servants, naturally. We we want stuff to be about us. We want to be special. We want to have servants for us, right? We want people to acknowledge our greatness and how amazing we are. That's our natural inclination. But when Mary you know, gets this news that she's going to be the mother of Jesus, she doesn't go, man, I'm awesome. Look how great I am. God picked me out of everybody. She says this, I am the Lord's servant. After all the incredible things that were said, all she said is, I am the Lord's servant. I'm willing to do whatever you ask. You can change the course of my life. You can put whatever baby inside of me you want. Uh, I am the Lord's servant. I'll do what you want. What an incredible awareness of God's work in her life that allowed her to respond that way. Because our, our extraordinary moments are going to be few and far between in our life, right? Most of our life is mundane. Most of our life is day to day. And we've got to be aware of the presence of God in us. Paying attention to what he's saying. Paying attention to how he's moving. Paying attention to, to what's going on inside of us. This is daily practice and training that we've got to to work on over and over again. And this is where the mundane becomes spectacular. 
See, Mary didn't know what was coming, right? She didn't have any, any hope for this. She had probably never thought once that God would say, I want you to give birth to the Son of God. Right? That wasn't even on her radar. She was just a humble servant willing to do what God wanted. And in verse 48, said, she said this, For he took notice of this lowly servant girl. Man, what a hard perspective to embrace. Our culture is pressing completely against this. I mean, moms, I mean, you are expected to do incredible things. You've got to work inside and outside of the home. You've got to clean. You've got to cook. You've got to do dishes. You've got to be like a Pinterest queen, right? You've got to know, have all the cute stuff going on. And you've got to be working out and looking good enough, dressing good enough to be able to take a selfie in the midst of it and be like, oh, yeah. Right? Right? I mean, there's so much pressure to, to, to be something spectacular, to be a superhero. But the reality is, God, all he wants from us is to be humble servants, responsive to him, ready to serve him. 1 Peter 5 says this beautiful verse, just kind of in contrast to this idea, that says, and all of you, dress yourselves in humility. Man, what a great verse to memorize as you're getting ready in the morning. Dress yourselves in humility as you relate to one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And Mary, in her humble estate, Receive the greatest amount of grace ever. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, He will lift you up in honor. Man, at the right time, in the moment when you're least expecting it, man, God surprises us all the time. My wife and I, um, as you probably noticed, did not give natural childbirth. If you didn't figure that out, then we can talk afterwards and I'll explain some things. But. Um, <laughs> But we had a long journey of just struggling with infertility, struggling with what to do next and doing fertility treatment and then considering adoption and going, wrestling through all this stuff. And we were just praying consistently throughout, just like, God, what do you want us to do? What direction do we go? How, what is our family supposed to look like? And it, it brought us to a place of humility whether we wanted to get there or not. He humbled us during that time. And there was one moment in this very room about three, four years ago where uh, World Vision came, they did this amazing presentation about kids in Africa and, and how we can help. And I'm just listening, just moved by, by God. And I'm like, okay, God, I'll move to Africa. I'll sponsor a thousand kids, whatever you want me to do. You know, that, how we get all emotional. And in the quietness of that moment, God just whispered in this ordinary life, he said, love on my kids through adoption. And that, that was what I needed. That's what I wanted to hear. That's what I needed to hear. This extraordinary invitation from God. Now, it didn't mean that we were going to be extraordinary. You know, we're not going to be on the news. Millions of people aren't going to know our story. But for God and what he wanted for us, it became this extraordinary opportunity. And the Holy Spirit works through us when we walk by faith. Walk by faith. Now, this is hard, right? It's scary. It's scary to walk by faith. We're vulnerable. We don't know what's coming next. Man, we love to control our lives, right? We want to put everything together just the way we want it. And if it doesn't happen the way we want it, we're going to yell at people and get angry in the name of Jesus to, to make it what we want it to be, right? We want to control it. We want, we want to know that we are making our lives what it should be. And we struggle to walk by faith. Mary struggled. She, she asked the angel, how can this happen? I'm a virgin. I think that's a fair question to ask, right? If I found out today I was going to be pregnant, I would ask that question and a lot of other questions, too. I have many questions, right? How can this be? She's wrestling with faith, and the angel goes on to explain what's going on. And she says this, in verse 38, May everything you have said about me come true. Man, what a bold faith statement. May everything you said about me come true. This is really hard to believe. I'm 13. I just found out I'm going to be the mother of God. But I, I, I want to believe in faith that everything you said is going to come true. And later when she goes to visit Elizabeth, this isn't in your notes, but in verse 45, Elizabeth said this to Mary, you are blessed because you believe the Lord would do what he said. Isn't that the, the crux of faith? Believing that God would do what he says. God says, I, I made you seem ordinary on this earth, but under the power of the Holy Spirit, I can make any ordinary life extraordinary. If you're willing, if you're able to surrender, I can, I can do anything in your life. I can do incredible things for each and every person here. That's the truth this morning. But we have to walk in faith. 
Faith journeys are hard, aren't they? I'm, I'm sure you guys can probably think of journeys where you waited for something for a long time. Uh, when I was 21, I, I felt a call to minister full time and, and just share the love of Jesus with people. And I thought I was ready, right? When you're 21, you're pretty much ready to conquer the world, right? You're really smart and you know everything you need to know. And like I was fully formed and developed, even though my brain wouldn't develop until I was 26. But that's okay. I was there, man. I love Jesus. And I'm like, all right, God, I'm ready. What do you want me to do? He's like, wait. A lot, a lot of long years of waiting, preparing, going to Bible college. Graduated from Bible college. And I'm like, all right, I'm ready. Got to put my resume out there, right? You know, everybody's got to know I'm ready to be a pastor and conquer the world. God's like, nope, wait. So I did. I waited tables at Applebee's. <laughs> and, and I did that for a long time. <laughs> many, many, many years. And it's a wonderful place, let me tell you, if you've been there. You know, it's high quality, high class. Make sure you take your moms there today. It's going to be amazing. Um, please don't. <laughs> Sorry, Applebee's. I mean, if you want to, go ahead. But... Right? It was a long, slow, painful process, and it was seven years before I got hired at Sandals Church to do what I love to do. And, and you probably have those stories. you got things that you waited for in faith. And at any point in that journey, we could have given up and said, God, you're full of it, right? You didn't do what you said you are going to do. I've been waiting for a while. I've been waiting for my husband to come around. I've been waiting for my kids to come back to Jesus. I've been waiting for that job promotion. I've been waiting to get through school. Whatever it is that we're waiting for. And we miss out on the opportunity to exercise faith when we give up on the process that God's taken us through. The Holy Spirit works through us when we recognize God's power. God's power. And this is really important, guys. Two weeks ago, we had the most memorable week ever in 13 years I've been at Sandals. Man, we had over 500 people stand up in two campuses, seven services, and say, I want to follow Jesus for the rest of my life. I want to be born again. And it was absolutely incredible. I've never seen anything like it. And I talked to several people that week around the city, and, and I think they meant well, but what a lot of them said was, man, wasn't Matt awesome? Wasn't it great what he did? Wasn't it great how he, he was? And Matt is awesome. He's an incredible leader. I love being under his leadership. He's my pastor. But that was not Matt Brown. I mean, he couldn't get us all to do handstands in here if we wanted to, right? I mean, I could tell you to do all kinds of crazy things. You're not going to do it just because I said it. I'm not going to get 500 people to do anything. That was the power of God. But we've got to recognize it, right? You can clap. That's great. God does great things. But he's not concerned about us getting credit for it, right? He wants everybody to know that it's him. Because he's the one who's worthy of praise. He's the one who's amazing. And it's not us. And Mary, when she found out this news, when Elizabeth greeted her, she responded and said, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For the mighty one is holy and he has done great things for me. What an incredible response, right? But we don't talk like that. If someone said that to you, you'd be like, okay, man, I'm glad you're pumped. Like, chill out a little bit, right? I mean, what's in Scripture, it's fine. But if we were to say that, oh, man, you know, let's, let's chill it out a little bit. And she went on for ten more verses talking about how amazing God was and all the things he'd done for Israel and all the things he'd done for her. And we struggle with that. It feels a little inauthentic and forced, right? And so the people that are a little, like, over-spiritual, you know, they're like, man, God just got me through brushing my teeth and he made it to, I made it to work and then he found me a good parking spot at work and blah, blah, blah. And we're like, okay, chill out, dude. We don't want to be associated with them, right? And so we're afraid to give God credit for things that God's done because we don't want to be one of the weirdos. But we struggle on the other side to appropriately give God praise and honor for the things that only he can do. And one of the things only he can do is transform an ordinary life into an extraordinary life. He can't do, we can't do that on our own. Only he can do that. Only he can make that happen. And Jesus developed these disciples, and two of them were named Peter and John, and these guys were fishermen. They were knuckleheads. They probably had, like, fish bones stuck in their teeth, you know, ratty beards, um, smelling like God knows what. And he chose these guys to conquer the world. They, they went into the streets of Jerusalem and started preaching about Jesus, and guess what? Thousands of people responded to their messages. Thousands. And they're coming to Christ left and right. And, and so it says the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. And here's why. 
for they could see that they were ordinary men. It was clear that these guys were not special, right? It, it was all over them in their appearance and the way they talked and their probably inability to speak well, that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. Man, that, doesn't that just speak to us? I, I mean, that's how we feel all the time, right? We're so ordinary, man. I, I'm not gifted like these other guys. I didn't go to Bible college. Like, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I didn't have the support I needed. You know, I haven't read through the Bible before. I haven't had an encounter with God. No angel has appeared to me. I don't have any special gifts to offer to God. These are the lies the enemy tells us all the time. And we just buy them hook, line, and sinker. And we sit on the sidelines and go, yeah, I guess I'm just ordinary. I guess I'm just not special. I don't have anything to offer. And God says, no way. Man, look what I did with these fishermen knuckleheads. I mean, we can joke about them, but they really weren't special. And neither was Mary. And neither am I, and neither are you. But God does something special when he ignites our life by the power of the Holy Spirit. This, we just sang this song about the same power that conquered the grave lives in us, right? And if we believe that, then it's true that God can do amazing things in our life. And we don't know when that's going to be. We don't know what it's going to look like. We don't know if it's going to be today or tomorrow or in 20 years. But we know that he can do incredible things in us when we submit ourselves to him, when we offer ourselves to him. And what it said about Peter and John is they also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. That's what made them special. They had spent time with the King of kings and Lord of lords, and his spirit was moving in and through them. Man, there is nothing more exciting than living by the direction of the Holy Spirit. You never know what tomorrow's going to bring. You don't know what today's going to bring. You don't know what he might ask you to do. And it's scary, right? Because we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what it's going to look like. And we have these moments in our lives where we're presented with the opportunity to do something incredible. I remember when we were faced with the decision to adopt our son, we were struggling because we were waiting for a little baby, a little tiny baby, right? And our baby was seven-year-old. Not a little tiny baby. That's, that's kind of a change in direction from your mindset, right? It kind of rocks your world a little bit. And so we're wrestling for a week. Man, how, how can, we don't know how to be parents. I mean, we're going to start with the baby so, you know, we can screw up and they don't know and they won't remember, right? And, and so we got a seven-year-old that they can hear things, you know, and they'll remember the things that we do. Like, uh, what if we, we aren't able to be great parents? And wrestled for an entire week, wrestling, 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 praying, afraid. I remember that last morning we had to kind of make a decision and I woke up early, which is awesome. We all love to do that. And, uh, but I just needed to pray and read. And so my daily reading was 1 John 4. And I opened it up and it says, perfect love casts out all fear. And God just said, that's for you. And it was just this moment that, that I'd been waiting for that I needed. And, and if I wasn't paying attention, I would have missed it. And I would have been too afraid and said no. I would have said no to what God offered me. No, we can't do it. We're waiting for a baby. And it became the most incredible blessing ever and the most extraordinary thing in our lives. I mean, it shaped our lives and it's extraordinary for him as well. And again, we're not going to be on the news. We're not going to be the, you know, the special family of the year. We just had the opportunity to do something extraordinary because it was what God wanted. It was about his kingdom, about what he wanted. And it may be insignificant in the, the annals of history, but for us and for our life, it was exactly what God wanted us to do but it was just a moment in the midst of everything that was going on. And if we're not paying attention, we miss those moments. Now, it's not to be afraid, like, oh, I already missed my moment. I remember when it was. Man, God is faithful. He's going to keep giving you moments, but we've got to humbly pay attention to the Holy Spirit and walk by faith in our lives. We can't give up on those things that maybe God stirred up that only he can do in our hearts. Maybe he put a dream or a vision in your heart to do something amazing for him. Maybe you have had no dream or no vision, I'm here to tell you that each and every person in this room, in this room, if you follow Jesus Christ, he wants to do great and incredible things. And I don't know if he's stirring your heart to do something today. I don't know if it's going to be on the way home. I don't know if it's going to be next week. I, I don't know what it's going to look like for you. But God wants to do great things, but you've got to offer yourself to him. You've got to say, I give up. I surrender. I lay down my, my plans. Lay down my pride. I'm willing. What does it look like? Do you want me to be a parent of a kid? Do you want me to just live my life faithfully so that other people see that God's real? 
Do you want me to take on this job? Do you want me to start this company? Do you want me to start this nonprofit? Do you want me to just be loving toward my spouse that's miserable to me? God can give you the power to do all those things through his Holy Spirit. And only he can do it. If you try and do it on your own, you will give up and fail at some point. But today you can decide to go, hey, I, I want to be open. I, I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I want the Holy Spirit to direct me in the path, the path that he would have me go. I want to be available to him. I want to, I want to show God that I, I'm willing to do whatever he has for me today. So here's what I want to ask from you this morning. Uh, we're going to sing another song in just a minute. If you guys would just stand to your feet. Um, you're not committing to anything. You're just standing up with me. And I want to pray for you. I know for some of you guys, maybe you're, you're hearing the message. You're like, nah, I'm not ready for that. I got some plans. That's fine. The Holy Spirit's going to keep working on you. He's pretty, he's pretty relentless. And for some of you, you're ready to respond to God. Man, it, just in the quietness of your heart, I, I want to just ask you to, to respond to God, to be open to him to be available to him. And I want to pray for you that he would do incredible things, that, that God would do more in this room than we would ever believe possible. So God, we thank you that you are the one who's incredible. We thank you that you take ordinary lives like ours and make them extraordinary by the power of your spirit. God, we offer our one and only ordinary life to you because that's all we have to offer. God, help us to pay attention to the movement of your spirit in us. Help us to pay attention to when you're talking to us. Help us to, to listen to your word. Help us to connect with other people who can speak into our lives. God, help each and every person who's willing to just offer themselves in surrender to you today. God, whether they don't even know you or whether they know you, that it would take just a step closer to you. And God, that you would begin to birth in each of us the things that you have for us. God, whether they be soon or later down the road, that you would give us the strength to uh, just persist in faith. We thank you that you are good and you love us. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.